Murphy, MD, director of the Courtney Medical Group, located at 3075 Washington Road in McMurray, Pennsylvania. For more information or to make an appointment, call 724-942-3002. That's 724-942-3002. For Dennis J. Courtney, MD. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to AM Impact on Your Health. AM Impact on Your Health, where every day our goal is to have you learn at least one thing to help you live better and longer. AM Impact on Your Health is heard each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9 o'clock. I'm Dr. Dennis Courtney, and I'm with you each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9. AIM Impact on Your Health, where each day you'll find current medical news, knowledgeable guests, fascinating health topics, and of course, where we do encourage you to call in to join in. Well, today, yes, it is a Friday version of the show, in a shortened week, no less. It is a get them up out of town version of the show in one way, but in another way, not. Our guest that will come with us today seems to have his Fridays open to spend some time uh, with us, as well as with most other interviewers. We take that time whenever he can give it to us. He's an extraordinary author, an extremely brilliant physician, uh, author of, I think, nine books. I, I'm pretty sure that's the count. Uh, but his, the, the, the work that we're going to be discussing today has to do with salt. Now, you bring up the word salt, or how about it being brought up to you, and especially by your doctor, and I'm telling you that he's telling you, avoid salt. Don't take salt. Watch your salt intake. Lower your salt. It is the mantra of the medical profession. Well, we're going to have some uh, discussion today that will fly in the face of all those warnings. Uh, and I think research and science will back this up. I don't know where these things get started, but this one about the salt is well entrenched within the medical community. How about this for a title, folks? Salt, your way to health. Sound like maybe it's inconsistent, the two, the two that is? Well, I think our guest today will prove to you that it is absolutely not, uh, that in fact you do need and should require salt. Maybe the kind of salt is going to be up for grabs here, but nonetheless, salting your way to health is our topic today with Dr. David Brownstein. He'll be with us right after our first break. Now, look, in the course of our discussion with David today, as is usually the case, and he's been um, on the show now multiple times talking about his first book on iodine, and it went to thyroid. Now... We're on the third one, and he's got quite a few more to go, so I'm going to guess we're going to have another of, uh, of other encounters with him this year. But uh, with each and every time we bring him on the air, if you want to call in to ask a question or to make a comment, that number, of course, as always, will be 412-825-6262. That's 412-825-6262, salting your way to health today. Now, uh, let's take a look. Oh, by the way. Wasn't that a great show we had on Wednesday with uh, Susan Smith-Jones? Uh, I thought that uh, she handled her remedies, you know, the ones that Grandma taught her, and I think other ones that maybe she picked up on her own. Uh, I had a previous list that emailed to me, the numbered up to 18. We got to number 7, and then we ran out of time. And I can tell you that uh, she, Dr. Susan Smith-Jones, is chopping at the bit to come back with you to complete this list and even go beyond it, uh, and it won't be till the month of August now, so you can just uh, sort of pencil that one in for the 3rd of August when Susan Smith-Jones returns, and we'll be talking about the remainder of her list of 18. By the way, you may have a couple things you probably want to ask her that isn't on the list. Let me give you a couple ideas of other things. Here's the one, by the way, that caught, that caught my eye. I, I um, was listening intently with the seven that we covered, uh, the one that sort of caught me off guard, I had never heard of it, had to do with mosquito or bee bites when you rubbed a raw onion. I had never heard of that one before. Uh, but the other stuff I had, and um, anyway, things like wrinkles, sore throat, fatigue, cold sores. Uh, how about the bally belly? A bally belly. Never heard the term? And then in quotation marks or a parenthesis, traveler's diarrhea. Anyway, she'll be back with us on the 3rd. We'll take it from, not the top, but halfway down through that list 
you enjoy spending time with us. Pencil it in for the third. Now, on Monday, Lee Weller is going to be with us. Uh, this issue of weight loss that I know many of you out there struggle with, very much concerned about weight gain, always want to lose, uh, and have some pretty elaborate ways of doing so, feel very good after you've accomplished your goals and objectives in terms of uh, the loss of the weight, but doggone it, if it doesn't keep creeping back up in roller coaster fashion, you know it, I know it. Well, our guests will know about it too. I'm going to give you some hints on Monday of how you sustain the weight loss. I think these are little hints that could be very beneficial to our listeners. You don't want to miss it. Lee Weller on Monday. Then on Wednesday, Alan Ridgeway comes back. He's been on our show many times before. Alan uh, is our representative of the medical community that supplies all of our diabetic patients with the supplies that they require to manage and maintain their disease and keep it at, at blood sugars at optimal levels. And also, too, he's the fellow, uh, we've had him on the show talking about this, too, who fits all of our patients, our diabetics, with uh, those orthopedic shoes. And now comes out with a, oh, by the way, don't forget the RTD dressings. Uh, the, but the, the, the best form of covering a wound at any, at any time is going to be these RTD dressings. We did a show on that before, and uh, we will be having the RTD dressings in the office. If you have a wound that just won't heal, that's the one I'm going to recommend to you. And now this new product, um, it has to do with those of you out there who may have muscular aches and pains, um, a product out there in the um, commercial market called BioFreeze evidently is an applique of a topical substance which does provide relief. I talk to people who utilize something like BioFreeze. They claim it gives them the temporary relief that they're seeking. Well, we got something to replace it. We'll have the product on hand when we launch, uh, at least for a while. I think we're going to be the only place you can get this stuff in the entire city of Pittsburgh, the product called Simply Freeze. If you have muscular aches and pains, you'll probably want to pay attention on the 13th, and that's the way it goes right now. I promised you, too, by the way, because we had calls about this. I know I shocked you a bit, rocked you a tad, when I got back from my conference of a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I had two big things to report to you. One was that there was a brand-new uh, addition to the list of blood tests that we will be getting here in the office. By the way, I just talked to the Dr. Camino's girls yesterday and said, hey, look, I'm now adding this one to the list. There's no longer nine blood tests that we ordered. There are now ten. And the new one, I don't know if you remember me talking about it uh, last week, is TMAO. Uh, the, is it an acronym for trimethyl amine oxide? It is a substance produced in the gut through uh, the presence of uh, unfriendly bacterial flora and then uh, can gain entrance easily into the bloodstream. It is supposed to be the most harmful of all inflammatory agents, superseding things like homocysteine and, and lipoprotein to the leg, which we will still all get. But I, I, I did launch that one, um, and we'll have a show on it, and I'll talk all about it in the upcoming future. And then that final statement, uh, which uh, I got calls upon calls. People are calling the radio. I promise before the month is up, we're going to have Ed Kane on with us, and we'll be talking about why it is. And I believe it truly is, and science will back us up, that you just cannot take fish oils anymore. It's been a standard. It's been a staple. It's been something that I've been recommending for so long, but it just the science is in, and you got to go with the science, folks. So uh, bear with me on it. I, I just don't want to take the time to uh, do a poor job on it. When I bring uh, it, the topic to you, I'll bring the science to you and the people with the science. It will happen this month, I promise you. Hey, we got a knock on the door. Come on in the store. Hello and welcome aboard. What is on your mind? Hi. Good morning, Dr. Courtney. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Is this radio? Right. Right. How have you been, Rich? I haven't heard you for a long time. Well, I was very busy, and unfortunately, I can't get you on our computer at work. Oh. I don't know why. It must be the FDA gremlins at work. Well, you mean you used to, and now you can't? Yes. Oh, so that's it. Well, I'm glad to hear you're healthy, right. wealthy, and wise. And uh, what's on your mind, Rich? How can I help you? Okay. Sometime 
time ago, you talked about a supplement dealing with uh, poison ivy. And I, 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 my wife was one of those people that she looks at it, she gets it. I talked about a supplement dealing with poison ivy. Yeah. Ah, you're stumping the band here. I'm trying to recall. What did I? Is, is this something you take orally or was something you applied? It was something that you take orally. Huh. Um, I got a pretty strong um, um, feeling about how to treat poison ivy. And I will say that the only thing that comes to mind is, uh, and using my own example, when I had a poison ivy in one arm, I reached under a lawnmower one time and I got poison ivy from the, the fingertips all the way up to the shoulder, and I tried, like the Dickens, Rich, I tried like the Dickens to um, use every nostrum other than conventional medicine in any form. And I was told to put toothpaste and, and this potion and this lotion, and after about three weeks I said, you know what, i got to give this up. I'm not getting any better. And so uh, me, who has the power to... Um, to write a prescription. I wrote one for myself for Medrol Dose Pack. Now, is that what you're referring to? Pardon? Medrol Dose Pack? I, I, I get to whatever you use, it, it works. I guess. Well, by the way, it will work in about 12 hours. So the, uh, the only catch is this is a prescription drug, okay? Right. Okay, so all right, then, then we are on the same page. I was thinking as you were speaking, I wonder what he's talking about, some sort of a a non-pharmaceutical, and I'm here to tell you that uh, when it comes to poison ivy, I don't hesitate. I use a Medrol dose pack. Medrol dose pack is a form of a steroid. Uh, it, it comes in a packet whereby you take a large dosage and then you taper down over about a five or six day period. It is the one way I know of to absolutely, positively turn poison ivy around in 100% of all cases, so I don't hesitate anymore. The term Medrol Dose Pack, okay? okay how do you spell it? M-E-D-R-O-L, Medrol. M-E-D-R-O-L. R-O-L, okay. And then the Dose Pack is just the form that it comes in where it's a, um, uh, it's sort of a uh, uh, plasticized uh, and encapsulated in tin foil, and you just punch out um, and it tells you for breakfast you take two, and then for lunch you take two, and dinner before bed, and so on and so forth. And you just follow along uh, with the prompts that the, the packaging tells you about. But I'm telling you, the symptoms are usually gone in 12 hours, and over the course of the six days, the poison ivy will actually go. you got to get a prescription for it, though, okay? Right, okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Courtney. Medrol dose pack. Hey, yeah, well, you got to have it on hand if your wife gets the poison ivy that easy. That is the way, the only way. I, I don't try to mess with it anymore with if myself or members of my family or my patients. That's I go, okay, we're going to the Metro. All right? Okay. Thank you. Thanks to hear from you. All right, radioactive rich folks. And by the way, don't go with the nostrums and creams when it comes to all kinds of, no, it just, doesn't work. All right, folks, let's take a short break. And in the interim, I'm going to go get David, David Brownstein, and his Dr. David Brownstein. He's written many books, one entitled Salt Your Way to Health. If you are in the salt scare generation, you've got to listen to this and so you can leave being a lot healthier than you were when you came in the door. Be back in a moment with Dr. Brownstein. Jay Courtney, MD. Have you become confused about how best to manage your health? It's no wonder. It seems that every time you turn on the television or radio, another expert has yet another suggestion for you to follow that seems to be reasonable enough, but no matter how dutifully you follow the instruction, it just doesn't quite produce the results that you are looking for. If this confusion sounds familiar to you, give us a call at the Center for Complementary Health, where we'll make some sense of the confusion based on a blending of traditional and alternative medicine that we've been perfecting over the last seven years. We offer metabolic nutrition testing, immune system repair, natural hormone replacement therapy, chelation therapy, cutting-edge allergy correction, and a host of other safe and effective alternative therapies. 
Dennis J. Courtney, MD, is located at 3075 Washington Road in McMurray. Phone 724-942-3002. Have you been to the doctor lately? Was the state top of your complaint list? Even if your doctor asks you what you need, the recommended five servings of fruits and vegetables a day is a dream in your busy schedule. What if you learned of a product five years in the formulation that delivers five servings of fruits and minerals in just one ounce? That's right, the truth of spirit. The blessings of truth of spirit are now formulated into a delicious whole fruit parade product rich in antioxidants and minerals. Your health is more than just a test result. It's a balance with physical, spiritual, and emotional factors. You work directly expressing your faith. Let truth of spirit help cover your nutritional needs in a convenient and cost-effective ounce a day. Call 1-800-442-3793 for a special promotional offer. Fruit of Spirit, a blessing for your good health. Fruit of the Spirit, five servings of fruits and minerals with no added sugar. That's 1-800-442-3793 for your good health. Call them now, 1-800-442-3793. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back once again to AIM Impact on Your Health. Heard here on KHB 620 each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9 o'clock. I'm Dr. Dennis Courtney with you on this Friday version of the show, slightly different. Um, normally we have uh, just a question and answer period, but when I get an opportunity to get our guest on board with us, and Friday seems to be the day that works best for his schedule, I take that opportunity and I'm so happy to see that he's willing to come on and uh, celebrate and share with you the similar information that he's imparted in his many books. I think they're number nine so far, and the number will continue to climb, I guarantee you. Today, a topic uh, that uh, I think will trigger some response in most, especially if um, you uh, have been under the salt scare alert that your family doctor more than likely placed upon you. How about the title for this book, Salt? your way to health. Now, if that causes a wince, you're going to want to pay attention today to our guest, uh, a physician uh, right, very close by in the state of Michigan. Uh, I've known him for a number of years, a board-certified family practitioner uh, who has a, a, a knack for hitting topics and presenting them to you in a way you can understand. Uh, this uh, fellow is a worldwide lecturer who participates in many radio and television shows throughout the country, and he continues to be a favorite guest of ours. His name, Dr. David Brownson, who's with us right now. Let's say good morning and welcome back, David. Thank you so much for coming aboard today with us. Well, thanks for having me on, Dennis. Um, David, uh, the um, the topics that you cover tend to always be ones that, uh, i got to tell you, there's just been an ignorance factor in so many areas out there in our conventional training and, and conventional medicine, and you seem to find the hole always where ignorance exists, and then you go ahead and plug that hole. So I don't know if you purposely do these things in terms of a mission for figuring out where you're going to go next, but there's no finer example than the area that we're moving in today. Uh, your motivation for writing a book entitled, of all heretical things, Salt, your way to health. What was the motivation behind that? Well, you know, it's an interesting story. I was uh, uh, finishing my iodine book, and in the Detroit Free Press, every Tuesday there was a health section, which was never too much about health. It was always about the latest gadget in the hospital. And in this health section, a uh, clinical nutritionist used to write a weekly column with question and answers written to her. So the question in about four years ago came to her, is there any difference between regular table salt and sea salt? Her answer was no, there's no difference. They're equally high in sodium and should be avoided. <laughs> well, the impetus for writing most of my books, Dennis, is I get annoyed about something. And I was annoyed about that answer. And I cut it out, pasted it above my computer and looked at it. And uh, as soon as I was done with my item book, I started working on my salt book, and you know, that's what we're going to talk about today. But so that's how it came to be, huh? That's how it came to be. Uh, well, yeah. I, I've been using unrefined salt in my practice for 15 years with great success, and 
you know, realized years ago that the fallacy that we need to uh, reduce salt in our diet. We're not, and actually most of us aren't getting enough salt in our diet. And the problem is most people don't know the difference between refined and unrefined salt, which we'll get into today. We absolutely will. Uh, but I think that you did, uh, and, and, and I can understand why it was, because it really bugged you to find out the answer to the question of the article written by the, the health professional of some type was, well, the, the two, I mean, things that glare at you from the perspective that you have now is there's no difference between refined and unrefined, okay, or, or sea salt and table salt, and that uh, you should, because of sodium, avoid them like the plague. And I think our profession is out there every day with that battle cry and been out there doing this uh, for many, many years. Uh, patients, when they hear me speak and talk about salt in the way that you've been able to teach me about it, uh, they just they get their haunches up. They get all upset because they think, my God, is this guy a quack? What, what is he talking about? So I, I understand uh, out, out there in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the air, in the atmosphere, conventional medicine has worked its will. And they have created another fallacy that needs to be shot at. Interestingly, you are so right with that, Dennis. Oh yeah. Now, interestingly, here we are. We we had this show planned for my goodness a month, David. You know, and lo and behold, yesterday, in one of our local papers, and I'm going to guess that it went countrywide. Here's the title of an article coming right out of yesterday's paper. Right when I went and looked at, it, I went, oh my God. This is like, uh, how did they know David was coming on the show? This is perfect. Here's the byline, folks. Uh, and David, I know that you know about this uh, article, but uh, let me uh, sort of get this a little bit out uh, in a service uh, as a way that we can move on the topic. The byline of this story, salt, heart disease, link disputed in a major study. This is a um, study done by what Rod Taylor at the University of Exeter in Britain, um, in an article published by the American Journal of Hypertension, that's a pretty prestigious journal, ladies and gentlemen, the researchers identified seven studies involving about 6,257 adults, some with normal and some with high blood pressure, who reduced the amount of salt in their diets. When they pulled the data to conduct a meta-analysis, which is like a combination of many studies, um, the researchers found absolutely, now here's the punchline, folks, no clear evidence that cutting salt um, cut the chances of dying from heart disease or dying from any other reason the researchers reported, essentially saying that it didn't matter whether they took the salt or didn't take the salt. It certainly wasn't harmful because if it would have been, there should have been some change in 6,200 people in a study. Now, David, comment a bit on the study, because I know you know about it. Maybe you know a little more about the, the players involved, but that's a pretty nice byline for a show where we're going to meet on Friday, and this comes out on Thursday in my local paper. Absolutely, Dennis, and uh, I saw the same headline. And in the study, now there's, there's two studies we're going to talk about today. This is one, as you mentioned, just was reported yesterday, or in the, uh, the original studies released earlier in the week. There was one uh, uh, about a month ago, um, another one that showed uh, the fallacies of salt. But in this study that you're quoting, that the researchers found when, they, uh, when people reduced their salt intake significantly, the best they could show when they pulled all these thousands of patients together in the studies was a reduction in systolic blood pressure of one to four millimeters of mercury. And this one to four millimeters of mercury did not result in a reduced cardiovascular rate or a reduced cardiovascular death rate. And um, this was an independent group who did the study. Uh, it's called the Cochrane Group, who doesn't take any money from Big Pharma. And they do these reviews all the time and get some very important information that I think we can trust in an independent group. One of the other things that wasn't what didn't quite hit the, at least I didn't see it in the lay press, was that they found that those with heart failure that went into a salt restriction diet had a 259% increased death rate um, from any cause. And that should have been reported because I've been researching and lecturing for years that when people reduce their salt intake, 
too much that their all-cause mortality goes up. And that's been shown in many studies, including this latest one that was just out yesterday. And that would be, uh, if there's ever a group of patients that would be instructed by their doctor to cut out any salt, it would be those who suffer from congestive heart failure for the fear that increased fluid overload, which they say would go hand in hand with this, would be uh, injurious to any CHF patient. Yet you say that there's an increase in mortality in, in those who cut their salt uh, significantly of 250 some percent. Absolutely, and uh, you know, Dennis, I was in medical school in the mid 1980s, and I clearly remember uh, congestive heart failure patients being told to, you know, avoid all salt. Still being told to them today. You know it. You do see patients. Oh yeah, they're, right? it's, they're still doing the yeah. same thing. That's it's it's the it's a wrong argument, and it's just kind of a wise tale that's been promoted year after year, and there's no science behind it, and there's no physiology behind it. People need salt. Salt's the second major constituent in our bodies, and if we don't have salt coming in, by my definition, we are you are salt deficient, and I would say the vast majority of patients that come see me are, especially new patients, for whatever reason, they're telling me very proudly that they're healthy and they eat healthy because they don't salt their food. And they're shocked when I tell them, well, you're salt deficient and I can pick it up from your blood test. Um, but this, this was a very important study and um, should put some dents in the conventional wisdom about salt and, um, you know, the, and really start focus on why people do need salt in their diet. They need the right kind of salt in their diet. Let's get to that right kind because I think that's, that's the first, this article, by the way, it's my guess. There's no mention about types of salt. They just use the word salt. And I'm going to interpret that to mean, I think you'd do the same, but they're really talking about refined salt. They're talking about the Morton's kind of salt, the kind of salt that has been around for so doggone long, iodized or unidized, nonetheless, it's dead salt. I'll let you take away uh, and, and just move into what I believe is a, the crux of the salt issue, which is... The right kind of salt really is the therapeutic kind of salt, and the terminology is refined versus unrefined. Would you take that concept and elaborate on it as you've done in your book and get that point across to our listeners? Dennis, whenever I lecture to doctors or lay people about salt, I always uh, go very slowly over this point that now on, I'd like the listeners to refer to salt as refined or unrefined not sea salt or, or Morton's table salt, but refined or unrefined. The reason I make that distinction is that any salt can be referred to as sea salt. It, all salt on the planet is from the ocean at some point in its life. And therefore, even Morton's table salt could be referred to as sea salt. So just because the salt is labeled as sea salt doesn't mean that it has the right minerals in it, doesn't mean that it's been, uh, it, it has not been refined doesn't mean anything to me. So let, let's look at our definition of refined salt. A refined salt is a processed uh, salt that's had all of its minerals removed and it's been bleached to make it white. And those are the salts we're all familiar with. They're in every restaurant across the country. And, you know, they're very fine crystals that can pour through little salt shakers that are on every restaurant table. And, and Morton's table salt is an example of this, you know, many people have in their home. And that's compared to unrefined salt, which has not been put through chemical processing. And unrefined salt has a full complement of minerals in it. And depending on where the salt is harvested from, there are slightly different mineral compositions of unrefined salt. But generally, there are over 80 essential minerals in unrefined salt, which are essential for proper body function. Um, there's not toxic additives like there is in refined salt uh, from the refining process. It's not been bleached. And one of the ways that you can tell a salt is unrefined is by the color of it. Usually an unrefined salt has some sort of color to it. And this color refers to the mineral content of the salt. I've been studying salt for 20 years. I've analyzed various different salts, uh, you know, with my own time and money. And found that unrefined salt, uh, like magnesium and potassium and calcium and a whole bunch of other minerals uh, that the body needs. And 
You know, our human body was designed to need and require unrefined salt. Salt is the second largest constituent in our body next to water. Our adrenal glands can't function without salt. Thyroid gland can't function without salt. Brain can't function without salt. The heart can't function without salt. And uh, I find unrefined salt uh, a wonderful addition to pretty much everyone's health regimen. Now, the, um, the number 80, uh, you say up, uh, upward and above, 80 different minerals found in unrefined salt. These minerals, by the way, um, the way I've been looking at this is that uh, in there, and uh, you have a long list of them in your book, but just to throw out a couple about something like, let's take rubidium, okay, which is, you know, a pretty uh, odd-sounding mineral. But nonetheless, there's an enzyme system somewhere in this body of ours that requires, I don't know, a molecule or two of rubidium in order to have uh, the metabolic uh, uh, processes that are going to be required in that organ to function at 100% efficiency. If you can't provide those lousy two molecules of rubidium, then there's got to be a workaround done by that organ. And so you've got 80, if you've got 80 plus minerals, they're all needed by some enzyme system in the body. If you can't provide them, if you can't bring them in, this body of yours is working like an old clunker car uh, that Obama was giving you credit for a year, a couple of years ago. Uh, does that make sense? Because there's an argument. Because I think uh, patients, when they hear it that way, really have a, a fond appreciation for why they better get on the stick and provide the body with those minerals. Fair enough. It's a great argument, and uh, uh, I like to work around uh, clunker car analogy. But you're totally right, and you know they. The main, one of the main problems I see with the vast majority of my patients is mineral deficiencies. And, you know, you can try and target magnesium and potassium, and, which I do, you know, when people are very low and, and recommend supplements with that. But to, to get an all-around mineral supplement that is easily absorbed, that feed unrefined salt. Hands down, there's no question. And just like you said, so many of these are trace elements. There's not much needed in the body. And people are deficient, and the body goes into a triage mode where it, it recognizes that it's deficient in rubidium or whatever item it's deficient in. So it tries to work around it, and it requires excess energy, and certain pathways are not opened up, and certain detox pathways don't work well, and you know, it sets the stage for disease to occur. And uh, many of this, much of this can be avoided with just simply doing the basics, you know, I would say the basics in anybody is maintain adequate hydration and um, ingest adequate amounts of unrefined salt. Now, in keeping with that and making one other point before we move on, I always like the Morton salt analogy because I say, you know, wherever Morton is, digs this stuff up, you know, some salt mine in whatever the, the great salt lake area, the Utah, Nevada, wherever the, they they take that salt and they send it to Morton's. And then Morton's takes, let's say the number 80, the, the, the 80 different minerals that are in the salt, they take out 78 of them, okay? And they give you two. Um, that's an interesting concept. You first were the first to bring it to me. And uh, they take the other uh, 78, they purify them, and they make a whole bunch of money off of those, David. They sell those back there. To industry in a purified form, they're making money hand over fist out of this all, aren't they? Well, not only are they making money hand over fist because they call those minerals. If you look at the the salt industry literature; they call those minerals impurities. So, they, those, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I'm, I would put quotation marks around impurities. Those aren't impurities; those are minerals. They're necessary things for our body. But they take those impurities and they sell them back to industry, as you mentioned. And you're right, they make hand over fist, and then uh, we see patients develop all these health problems, and they need all these, these blood pressure pills and things to control their essential hypertension, when most of the time this essential hypertension is forming from mineral deficits. Um, and it's, you'd be amazed at how many times in my practice I put a hypertensive patient back on salt, and I'll tell them to measure it out, and to use it, and we'll follow their levels. And the blood pressure comes down when they use the right kind of salt, which is unrefined salt. Now, you mentioned uh, a, a patient, a hypertensive patient, 
and I think it, it is fair to say that there is a very small segment of the hypertensive population or population in general that actually doesn't do well with salt. It's fair to bring that up because the number is small. I'd like to know how small it is, but can you talk about those individuals? And by the way, folks, you already know who you are, okay, because it's not like you, you could have this happen to you and not be unaware of it. If you uh, have a real sensitivity to use of salt, you have violent symptoms when you consume salt, so you've known about it for years, but at least talk about it for a moment, Dave, because there are some people that really can't handle salt, but they know who they are, don't they? Dennis, the, the people that need to be careful with salt ingestion are kidney failure patients. The kidneys are very important with controlling electrolyte balance, salt balance in the body, and kidney failure patients need to closely monitor their electrolytes and closely monitor their salt intake, and they cannot deviate from, from tight ranges of how much salt they can take in. The other, and those, those there's, you know, not, not many of those, and the other group of patients that you're referring to are the salt-sensitive patients, and there are very, very few of those. Um, and those patients, the blood pressure will go up when they ingest small amounts of salt. Um, now, that usually is not the case with unrefined salt, but occasionally I'll see that. Then it's that one in a million. And that's small. Like that every five to six years, you know. It's not many in a full-time practice in a state. Well, I'll pass that on to our listeners. That That's really a small number. You you put it in its right right context, then. Um, to think that you're in that, you know, one in a million category, uh, you, you need to check. You would have to check your blood pressure, what, immediately after consuming salt, and then you would know if you're that person. Uh, and well, what, what, well, usually what I see with those patients is they will float up after uh, increasing their salt intake. And, and again, Dennis, it's very, very few patients. Um, and unrefined salt just does not cause problems with the vast majority of patients. And, um, you know, I find there are patients who uh, ingest unrefined salt, have lower blood pressures, and better health markers, better thyroid function, better adrenal function, uh, better brain function. All right. So uh, the movement to unrefined salt, uh, is, the case has been made, and I think I uh, don't have to spend too much more time on it, about those 80 minerals, and you need every one of them, and you can't get them through refined salt, the Morton's kind of salt, that white stuff that sits on the table. You, as long as you move to these unrefined forms, I think you, you make the case for um, Celtic sea salt, uh, you make the case for red mons, Himalaya. Any other names out there that would be of interest to our listeners that you know of that, uh, by brand at least or, or category, should they should consider? Well, Dennis, there's unrefined salts from all over the world. Now, I have, the reason I mentioned those three in my book is I tested those three for their their mineral and toxicity content, and I found all three very clean, very reproducible test and good mineral content. Um, <clears throat> what I've used in my practice is Celtic salt and the Redmond salt. And I've used those over the Himalayan salt because the Himalayan salt is three times the cost. And when I do the analysis of the salt, I really don't see any great difference in the mineral contents uh, between the three that requires you to spend three times the amount of money. The Celtic salt and the Redmond salt is both very inexpensive and very reasonably priced, and uh, it has they have worked fabulously in my practice, and they certainly make your food taste better as well. Okay. Um, take this one. Um, another factor you mentioned, and I never heard it made before, was in the issue with with the issue of pH and how unrefined salt can assist in maintaining a correct pH. Could you spend a moment or two to talk about that reason for why you should be taking the unrefined salts? Well, well Dennis, one of the reasons that I became involved with looking at salt was when I became a holistic physician, I actually started looking at patients as whole human beings and you know what's off in the physiology and trying to correct that physiology. One of the things I came to was that it was very important to maintain normal pH. 
and a pH measures the acidity and alkalinity of the body. And we were designed to have a pH in our bloodstream around 7.2. <clears throat> when we were, when I was in residency and I used to work at the ICU, we used to monitor the pH very closely. And when the pH of the bloodstream went up or down with just a small little change, you knew patients were in trouble. You were taking measures to counteract that. Well, my experience has been that those with chronic illness generally have low pHs or acidic pHs. Generally, the thicker they are, lower their pHs. And I found that patients who had very low pHs and were very sick really had a difficult time proving or improving their health or just even overcoming their illness if that pH was not normalized. And I, and I tried various things and, you know, what it came down to was trying to, one of the best ways to regulate pH was minerals. Minerals are safe, they're effective, and you're, you're, you're correcting a mineral deficiency problem and correcting a pH problem at the same time. Uh, and when patients' pHs came back up, uh, they had many health benefits. One, of, one thing I noticed right away was uh, allergy symptoms got better. And many patients who had food and environmental allergies with pHs below 6.0, as soon as their pH came up to a more normal range around 6.5 to 7.2, their food and environmental allergies settled down and went away. And uh, the so This must have been urinary pH, huh? This was saliva pH. Saliva pH. I find saliva, saliva pH more closely replicates the capillary pH than the urine. And it's much easier to follow saliva pH and to uh, manipulate the body and look at the changes in the saliva versus the urine. The urine's a problem because the kidneys try to maintain normal electrolyte function and normal pH function, and they will, will adjust depending on what you're eating and what's happening in the body very quickly where the saliva just is a little more stable to measure. That's been my experience. And I check, I have patients check the saliva pH with pH paper, which costs about $2. First thing in the morning, just keep a little log of what their pH is. You just wet the tongue with saliva. I mean, you wet the pH paper with saliva. And you look at the color on it. And there's a little rainbow wheel that comes with it. You just measure, you know, match up the color and write it down. Write down the number associated with the color. And uh, you can follow what you're eating and what you're supplementing with and what your drug therapy or nutrient therapy is and see how it's affecting the pH and make changes and follow that in a very inexpensive way. And the, prop, and the proper salt intake you found to be that uh, which is able to naturally manipulate pH and bring it from acidic ranges up to the normal ranges of uh, alkalinity, huh? The two best things that I've seen to normalize somebody's pH is unrefined salt and iodine. And this, when you put someone on uh, unrefined salt and iodine, there's a synergistic effect with pH, meaning that, you know, one plus one item here does not equal two, it equals four or five. They, the pH dramatically improves very quickly with both items versus just using one or the other. And uh, uh, I tell the story in my book about uh, patient of mine, Sue, who had uh, stage four metastatic breast cancer and really miserable and dying and uh, came allergic to everything under the sun and couldn't eat food and she was uh, eating white rice and broccoli or something like that. It's about all she could tolerate. was wasting away and her pH was consistently reading below six. And I put her on, she was already on iodine, um, but I added unrefined salt to that regimen and had her keep checking her pH, and within three days, her pH started to climb above six. Once that pH hit above 6.5 for her, that her, it's like a switch went off and her allergies went away. She could eat again, gain weight, felt much better, and um, uh, you know, looked better, and, and you know, her symptoms got much better. And interestingly with Sue, a few years later, got off her salt, but forgot about it for a while. The age went down again, she came to me, she couldn't eat, she was losing weight. And, you know, again, checked her pH, which had fallen again, and you know, put her back on the salt. She was still taking the iodine. And, uh, you know, as soon as it came up above that 6.5 mark, her food allergies 
significantly declined. And he's been well for about 12 years after that diagnosis. And, uh, uh, There's something as simple as that. Something as simple as that. I mean, the cancer eventually killed her. She was given three to six months to live when she was diagnosed. And, you know, it was a good 12 years and worked pretty much the whole 12 years. She uh, was, you know, struggling with this. They had a pretty good quality of life during that time. I mean, David, you treat the cancer patient with salt and iodine? <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and and they got 12 years, and I'm sure there was much more in that treatment plan than that. There was more in the treatment plan than that, but though I, w I would say that was the biggest bang for our buck. Really? And you didn't spend a lot of bucks for that, both iodine and salt. No, are she did not. Inexpensive supplements, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I see this recur over and over and over in my practice as a, you know, a theme of improving one's health and improving one's chronic illness. All right. By the way, there was a knock on the door. By any chance, is that person uh, still out there? Anybody out there? Hi. Hello? Oh, you're still there? Oh, thanks. Thanks for waiting. We were into a, a concept. David, people want to get at you and ask you questions. You don't mind it, do you, David? Of course not. Come on ahead. You're with Dr. David Brownstein. What is on your mind? You you held out long enough. Take the airway, ma'am. It's yours. Yeah, I just have three quick questions, Dr. Courtney. Um, the one is, regardless of what type of... Um, salt it is, doesn't the heart eat it just for the conductivity throughout the organs of the body? You are so, right. And also, uh, okay. There, way, have, let's take that one right off the bat. You are, you are, you are right, and we're, we're in an epidemic of heart arrhythmias and uh, nerve problems in the body, and there's no question that we are electrical beings and we need the right electrolytes to to have the right rhythm in our heart, the right electrical activity in our heart, the right electrical activity in our nerves, and it's also wonderful help for people with problems with that. I think it's just that we Americans don't need it in um, packaged food because it's way, you know, way too high in there. Um, but the other question was, uh, um, Dr. Courtney was for, for Radio Rich. Mm -hmm. um, if I could get this in, the Onyx, there's for poison ivy. Go ahead, ahead. It's called Onyx. Um, and you take either a homeopathic palette before you go out to work in the yard, or you take a cream when you first start to um, when you first start to see it on your skin. You put the cream on. They have so they have two different scenarios to use. It's homeopathic, huh? Yeah, and I don't know what the website is, but it's, the brand name is Onyx, and I believe Dr. Sass has a homeopathic. Um, but I also had a question, another question for. Um, the doctor there. I wanted his opinion. I know Dr. Courtney, your opinion on the fish oils, um, but I wanted Dr. Brownstein's opinion of the fish oils for um, overall endocrine health and or inflammation in the body. Thank you so much. Yeah, David, a lot of recent literature, uh, and I, I made a blurb here a week or two ago. Uh, I don't know if it's worked its way to you yet, but it appears that science is coming and finally letting us know that fish oils, which I've been prescriber of for a long time, are really not too helpful and and actually can be injurious. Are you familiar with any of the literature that's reflecting this at all? You know, Dennis, I've never been a big fan of fish oil. Companies. You never have, huh? Uh, ah. There's why? And how did you? How? Why were you so enlightened when we were out there pushing this stuff? You weren't. Well, here, here, here was my take on it. There were. There were, there's two essential fats in our body, omega-3 and omega-6. And my feeling was that if you're just going to use an omega-3 supplement and high dose, you're going to push those ratios of a normal ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is about 1 to 1 or maybe 2 to 1. And you're going to push that ratio way out of balance. And it never made physiologic sense or biochemical sense to do that. And I felt... And I also observed in my patients when I tried fish oil for a short period of time, I felt that initially they would get improvement in an anti-inflammatory effect, but I also felt after about three to four weeks, they would get almost a steroidal effect in the body. And you, I had a very difficult time uh, balancing the hormonal system, uh, in particular if they were on high-dose fish oil. So I never quite bought into that, and I always felt that if you're someone's going to supplement with fish oil, they should use some omega-6 fat along with it. Good omega-6 fat. You, you know? are really... You have been vindicated, doctor. And so while we were out here pushing this stuff, and I've been one of them, uh, of course, 
I think we have to thank uh, Udo Erasmus talking about good fats and fats to heal and fats to kill and the balance. But um, uh, the one thing, and, I'll, and I, for my listeners as well as um, to, to sort of uh, provide you with the scientific explanation for how you've been right all along, it's now known that you need a balance between omega sixes and omega threes of four to one, and the form should be in this small carbon chain of linoleic, which is your omega six primrose oil, you know, plant derived, and your omega three alpha linoleic, which is flaxseed. The ratio of four to one. This is where the science has come to. It's now known. It's been it's been um, proven. And so uh, th that's one thing to think. Okay, we got a balance here. Sounds like it, uh, that's very good to science. But uh, the part that was displaying me was it actually is harmful to be taking fish oils. The length of the carbon chains are so long that they they do injure membranes when they're supposed to be trying to help them. And, and it was a little sidelight for that, and the, the caller uh, had, had brought it up, so I thought I'd throw a little two cents in there and, and let you know about the science, David. There, there, will be, there will be more to come on this subject, and you will see your vindication play itself out in the scientific community. Um, it wouldn't be fair as we're, we're coming up here. I'm going to get two things established right now. I'm going to let you take a moment or two. Please tell our listeners how they can get a hold of your books, how they can get information about, you have so many different ways for them to learn. Uh, you got DVDs, you got CDs, you got them all, David. Take a moment and let our listener know, listeners know how to get a hold of these things. Well, they can look at my website, which is uh, drbrownstein.com, D-R-Brownstein, B-R-O-W-N-S-T-E-I-N.com, or they can call 888-647-5616. You can also sign up for a blog that I have on my website. It's a free blog, and um, you know I uh, generally write about topics in the news that I generally get irritated about. Same reason I write my books, and um, you know I try and educate people so they can make better health choices and not get sucked into the pharmaceutical model. Well, um, I hope my listeners take you up on your offer for your books. I will tell the listeners once again. You wrote it with the with the um, non-medical person in mind. You, your books are so easy to read; they will not be um, perplexed and bogged down in the minutia that sometimes occurs in in scientific writings. But your science is there on every single page. It's just you make it in a way that people can read it and they can understand it and not be burdened with a, a bunch of medical mumbo jumbo. So I, I I've always saluted you on that, David. You've got that knack to be able to do that. Um, the other thing I want to do, and uh, although we've got a few minutes left, is that, uh, as usual, David, we are not going to be able to cover this topic fully today. And you get a promise, and off air, maybe we can find out what uh, time in August, if that's going to be a appropriate, that you could come back. You promise to come back on this subject? I would love to come back on this subject. Okay. And then we'll we'll schedule that um, uh, in time that when we get offline today, and, and um, uh, off air, excuse me, right after the show. And I'll let my listeners know when they can expect your return. Um, with respect to um, how we probably should pull it close today, because we just do have a couple of minutes, um, how about some of the problems that uh, you've been able to document? This salt scare generation has been around a, while, a long time. Um, the, uh, the public has fallen in lockstep with their doctor's commands to avoid salt and low salt, no salt, uh, be the, be the mantra for so long. What are, what, what are some of the problems that develop because of this low salt scared uh, multiple generations, not just one? Any well, Dennis, the, the interesting thing, and I cover this in my book and you know, when I lecture, is that low salt diets are associated with more heart attacks, um, lipid problems, high cholesterol, high LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, uh, uh, stroke, you know, everything just the opposite of, uh, of what you thought. What they tell you. And yeah. uh, uh, all, the, other, the other interesting thing with low salt diets is that there is more difficult hypertension to control and uh, requiring more medication. And I cover this in detail in my book and, you know, when I lecture to doctors and give the mechanisms behind it. But 
people need salt, and they need the right kind of salt. And I would suggest for your listeners to pick up some Celtic brand sea salt from Salinas. And I have no financial dealings with these companies. Salinas uh, Salt Company or Redmond Salt. And um, start introducing it to your family and start using it. And family for most people, about a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon a day uh, is sufficient. Unless they're high, heavy exercises, they'll need a little bit more. Salt to taste, huh? Salt to taste. You got it. All right, we got bombers in the background, David. That usually means, well, it's time to get on out of here today on this Friday. Uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank our listeners. I hope uh, we've been helpful to you in bringing a message. Uh, the science, always the science behind that message. And uh, Dr. Brownstein's uh, book, Salt Your Way to Health, is available to you uh, through the 800 number and through his website. Uh, we're going to say goodbye now on air. But off air, David and I will continue just a little bit longer. I'll let you know when we get back on Monday when David will return to discuss how you can continue to salt your way to health. Thank you very much, David, for being with us today. Thank you, Dennis. There you have it, folks. Have a wonderful weekend. Until Monday with Lee Weller talking about uh, how to maintain your weight loss. This is Dr. Dennis Courtney with Dr. David Brownstein saying so long for AM Impact on Your Health.